Okay, you're in the stream live on Al Jazeera and on YouTube. Today, we're update three stories we've been keeping a close eye on. I'm Malika Bilal with a story our community has been buzzing about. Zimbabwe has a new president who's tasked with handling an economic crisis and steering the country out of political crisis. And in the United States, a leaking oil pipeline has mobilized activists. But first, a decision by the Trump administration has Haitians both in the US and in Haiti concerned about their future. It is unfortunate, despite everything that has been said, and even the Haitian government stated that Haiti cannot absorb 60,000 Haitians to go back home at once, that uh, the Trump administration keeps saying that Haiti has made progress, and uh, it's based on that they want to terminate a TPS for Haiti. But we have to remember that this is not a Haitian issue. TPS is a national issue because there's over 300,000 uh, TPS recipients in the United States. Since we first discussed temporary protection status in early November, the Trump administration has determined that the status issued to Haitians living in the United States after an earthquake in 2010 is no longer needed. Almost 60,000 Haitians living in the U.S. now have until July the 22nd, 2019 to go home or change their visa status. Activists say that conditions in Haiti are still poor and the country will not be able to cope with the sudden return of so many people. Since the earthquake, the country has been hit with a cholera epidemic, hurricanes and unemployment is estimated to be more than 60 per cent. Haitians living and working in the U.S. are vital to the Haitian economy, with remittances making up to 30 per cent of the country's GDP. So, how are Haitians in the U.S. being affected by the decision and what plans are they making? Here to help us discuss, Mirta Abraham is a TPS recipient and lives in Miami. And Jacqueline Charles is a Caribbean correspondent for the Miami Herald. Welcome back to the stream, both of you. I want to start on my laptop with a tweet from a member of our community. Lisa writes in, Haiti is still reeling from natural disasters and is not ready to receive 60,000 people. Their own government has said as much. Haitian TPS recipients are working in key industries here in the U.S., like hospitality. This decision doesn't make sense economically and tears U.S. families apart. Mirta, I want to start with you. How are you reacting to the news? How are you feeling right now? About the news, too, I feel hopeful about the news. About 2019, we have to leave the country. I feel hopeful for, for me, for my family, to be separated from my daughter. Because Haiti, we're not ready to receive these people. I'm not ready to go back Haiti because I don't have nothing over there. Um, Jacqueline, how ready were yes. you for this for this news to happen? I, I know Haitians all over the U.S. were anticipating it. Uh, they were hopeful, but they weren't sure what was going to happen. How did you cover this story? Well, I suspected that it was going to happen. I mean, we have to remember that earlier this year when they decided that they would renew it for six months, I sat down with Kelly, who's now chief of staff, John Kelly, but at the time he was the head of DHS. And he said, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do um, come November, but I told the Haitian president to prepare to bring his people home. And when we look at this administration, we look at how President Trump campaigned in terms of immigration, I think the stakes were really high that TPS was going to come to an end. And in fact, at the Miami Herald, we were the first ones to actually break the story before DHS made the announcement. We got it confirmed from several sources and we hit the, you know, the, the push button. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion in the Haitian community. When people heard 18 months, they thought, wow, Wow, we won. We got what we wanted. No, you wanted 18 months, but not with a final termination date. And that is where we are now. And 18 months goes very, very quickly. It's not a very long time. You know, someone here might agree with you. Cassandra here says, why send people into a place devastated by earthquake and hurricane and a place where it can happen again? See climate change. Who benefits from sending people into harm's way? TPS is nonsense. There should be an opportunity to apply for permanent status. Jacqueline, what is that uh, transitionary period looking like for members of TPS? What can they do to apply for permanent status? 
Well, a lot of people have to just reevaluate their own situation. Are you married and your spouse is an American citizen? Okay, that is one way you can adjust your status. Or do you have a child that is U.S. born, that is an American citizen, and that is the age of 21? That will allow you to adjust your status. But the reality is, is that a lot of people have documentation issues. They entered the country um, undocumented, so they have no proof that they actually were in the United States. They enter into the United States. First and foremost, you have to go see an attorney. Go and see somebody who is legally an attorney that's going to give you good advice and look at your situation and is going to tell you what your alternatives are. And let me just say one other thing. You know, what people are failing to realize is you have somebody like, like Mirta who's living here in the United States and who has a child, regardless of whether that child was U.S. born or that child was born in Haiti. But that child has been educated in the U.S. education system, an English system. Now for you to uproot that child who's 11, 10 years old, take them to a country, whether it is Nicaragua, where they also term or whether it's Haiti, where the language system, the education system is French-based. And what do you do as a mother? Do you have that child restart everything from grade one, or do you leave that child in the U.S. to continue with your education? These are the decisions that families are ha having to face. And in most instances, families every time are going to choose the future of that, that child, and they're going to be forced to leave that child behind. And for them, that's going back to Haiti. Where are they going to live? What job are they going to do? You have a country 60% unemployed. Employment. You have a country, over 300,000 houses were destroyed just last year with Hurricane Matthew. We're not talking about the earthquake that left 300,000 dead. So when the U.S. government talks about conditions have improved, everyone is asking, what is the improvement? Where's the checklist? Show me the number of houses that have been built. Show me, you know, improvements in the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Where is the $83 million hospital that the U.S. promised to build? And almost eight years after the earthquake, it still doesn't exist. Jacqueline, activism on this issue, the idea that Haitians, 60,000 of them, should be allowed to stay in the U.S. It comes in all shapes and sizes, all ages as well. Let me show you one little girl who put online a message for President Trump. Have a look. Have a listen. How are you, President Trump? I would put myself in the shoes of these parents with U.S.-born children. It is not hard to do since you are the son of immigrants. You are also very smart. You married an immigrant woman. So I would empathize with them, feel for them, and understand how painful it must be to be forced to leave their children behind. I mean thousands of children of all ages or take them to Haiti, Honduras, Salvador, and other places where immigrants of all races are deported to. All they know is the U.S. They are as American as apple pie, yet forced to us. See, Misa, I'm thinking about your little girl and projecting ahead 18 months you have to make a plan. You have a child. What is your plan? Right now, my plan, I have to talk to send a message to Mr. President Trump. So he wants to separate family, send Haitian to Haiti. So this, this is not the way he wants to make the America great again. Last week, like all, November 11th, 21st, we was in Malago for testing. Mm. about the TPS, how he hiring, hiring 70 people with visa, temporary visa to work in his place and his hotel. Yeah. So he wants to get rid of us. He already in the country working, pay taxes, already legal started to work here. Me so he wants to get rid of us, then he wants to get people with temporary visa to work in his hotel for his own benefits. This is not the way he helped the country. Uh -huh. He want to, This is the but way he wants to help. Have you decided what you're going to do? Have you decided what your next step? Are you going to go back to Haiti or, you, or are you going to take your child with you? Where I'm going to take my child with me? I have no house home. I don't have nothing in my country because I left the country January 2010, January 11, 2010. The earthquake happened on the 12th. Everything I had lost, my family lost everything. So since that time, I never mm. been there because no house. I have nothing over there. That's why I never go there. So, Mirta, again. let me just so let I, me just let me just push you. So, 18 months from now, where will you be living? Where do you think you'll be living? I live in right here in the U.S. You're not going anywhere. I'm, All right. I'm not going. To, I already here. I'm working, taking care of my daughter, and help also my mother in Haiti. All right. So, Mirta, I, I ask. 
Me too, Jacqueline. We hear you. Yes. We really appreciate this. I, this story isn't going anywhere. It's not over yet. We have 18 months more of reporting to do, but we will leave it here for now. Please come back and update us as the story progresses. Thanks for being on the stream. Well, from the United States, we shift to Zimbabwe. What lies ahead for that country? November 2017 will go down in Zimbabwe's history as the most dramatic and arguably most historic month in Zimbabwean's politics post-independence. Uh, it was a month filled with high drama, uh, tensions. It was, to all intents and purposes, a political roller coaster ride. Now, whether Emerson Munangagwa is the right person to be taking over from Mugabe is something that the people of Zimbabwe will have to decide, and they will have their moment to decide uh, in 2018 through an election. Otherwise, for now, the new president will, have, will be relying on performance legitimacy and a lot of people are watching to see what it does and whether his entry into the presidium or the president of the country will mark a departure from the politics of the past or whether it is political business as usual. Emerson Munangagwa has his work cut out for him, but in a case seen as a barometer of judicial independence in the post-Mugabe era, on Wednesday, a Zimbabwean court found activist Pastor Evan Mawaride not guilty of attempting to subvert the government. His This Flag movement began some of the largest protests the country had seen against corruption. Well, Evan joins us now from Harare. And also back with us, we have Al Jazeera's Africa correspondent, Haru Matassa. Good to have you both, both smiling broadly. Uh, Pastor, I have to share this tweet that you shared with so many people yesterday. Your smile fills the screen. My fellow citizens, it is my absolute pleasure to inform you that I've been acquitted of all charges. Thank you for your prayers and support. Let's join hands in building a better Zimbabwe. Where were you? How did you get this news? Well, I was uh, right in the courthouse um, at the time. It was just after the um, uh, the judgment had been given, and um, it really was just uh, the apex of uh, um, uh, a journey. For I mean, for, for any description, has been as horrible as they come. Uh, but thankful that we were able to finally get to a place where we could get a judgment uh, that uh, said I was not guilty of all the charges that had been laid against me. Uh, there's a tweet here underneath one of the tweets that you sent out there, Pastor. This is Stabisa, who says, congratulations. It wasn't going to make sense for you to stand trial for attempting to overthrow Mugabe with a tweet when those who managed to overthrow him with guns are not even facing any charges. What do you think is behind your acquittal? Do you think it is the change uh, in leadership, uh, the actual men, of course, not the, the ruling party? Or do you think that this is something else? Well, I, 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 it, would be, it would be very difficult to imagine that the change did not play uh, a role in it because I think that there is a change of administration. And some of the um, characters that were behind my arrest and continued, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, frustrating uh, or frustration uh, are some people that are now in jail themselves or have left the country. But I think it's also important to note that this case was never really going to go anywhere. It had no legs from the beginning. There was no basis for my arrest. I should never have been arrested to begin with. They could not prove a thing that they were charging me with. And it was purely uh, you know, politically motivated and designed to frustrate me. So I think there's a bit of both here. The realization that there was an opportunity to acquit because this case was going nowhere. But there was a lot of political pressure on those who were uh, at least attending to the case. Haru, I'm going to share with our audience one of your most recent tweets. It is of uh, presidential regalia, and you have a baseball cap here, Zim colors, and a crocodile on the front. That is because the new president's nickname is the crocodile. It's not necessarily a compliment, Harry. Do you want to explain, unpack it for us a little bit? Well, he has a bit of a controversial history. Um, he's been... I suppose some people say implicated or complicit in some human rights abuses, particularly back in the 1980s in Matbilan province. Some people are skeptical about him, but at the end of the day, he is what Zimbabwe has. Every Zimbabwe knows that even if you love him or hate him, he is what you have until elections in 2018. And the euphoria has died down, but now there's, for some people, it's cautious optimism. And he seems to be saying the right things for now. For example, he wants a smaller government. He wants people who stole money and sent it abroad to bring it back by February or they'll be arrested. The ZANU PF Congress happening in December. He says we'll no longer spend $8 million on it. We'll only spend $1 million on it. And in a surprise um, 
situation today, he visited some of the public hospitals uh, by surprise, uh, surprised most of the staff in these hospitals, just to see the conditions that poor Zimbabweans have to go through. But, 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 that said, there are people who are cautious about him. They're saying, remember, he was in Robert Mugabe's government, the former president, from 1980. Uh, he... Uh, I suppose, helped Mugabe stay in power for 37 years. One man actually said, it's the same bus. The driver has changed, but mm -hmm. the conductor has taken over, but it's the same bus. So really, is he going to change anything? So some people are optimistic, some people skeptical. skeptical. He is called the crocodile because he's known to be shrewd. He's known to be calculating. Whether Zimbabweans know whether that's good or bad for them, only time will tell. Well, how are those two camps that you laid out there? We're seeing the exact same thing among our community in Zimbabwe, in which we got lots of tweets from people. Um, on one hand is Ter. He says, disillusion of change is what Zimbabweans are experiencing. Apart from age, there is not much difference between both men, of course, Mugabe and Munangagwa he's talking about. And then you have ZANU-PF, the ruling party, still calling the shots. On the other side of that coin, though, uh, this is CDE, who says, those who believe that he's the same as Mugabe are those people who think that people from the same family always do the same things. I believe in him because the work he's done so far is great. Pastor Evan, which camp do you fall in? Well, I think I think I fall right in the middle um, where I have both, um, uh, you know, a, a, a good dose of optimism, uh, but also, uh, you know, a good dose of caution, just like Haru said that this really is uh, the same bus just a different driver. Mm -hmm. But let me maybe tell you where my optimism comes from. It comes from the fact that as Zimbabweans, we have walked this journey for the last 37 years, particularly the last maybe 20, 25 years, which, which has just been horrible. We have lost everything in terms of uh, our dreams, in terms of uh, physical money. We have lost family in terms of people that have moved out of the country under Robert Mugabe's leadership. And the optimism comes from the fact that this is a different man, more so in the last few uh, months, who has had a sharp disagreement with Robert Mugabe. And the thought here is that possibly, just possibly, he may want to prove to the people of Zimbabwe that he is something that is starkly different from Robert Mugabe. And I think that is part of where our optimism lies. He is what we have right now. And I think that it does not hurt us to have uh, you know, a good dose of optimism uh, going forward. And the last few days uh, seem to be pointing in the right direction. Haru and uh, Fasta, I want to share this with you from Welly. Welly says the past few weeks were in labor, delivering a beautiful, bouncing baby girl. Now she's with us. All attention is around her. Everybody likes her. We all wish the best for our new Zimbabwe. Ours is a blessed family. I have to put it to you, Zimbabweans, you're really good at analogies and metaphor. Haru, in a sentence, how would you sum up this past Goodness me, it's like 10 days. How would you sum it up for you as a reporter, as a Zimbabwean? Oh, uh, wow. Um, I went through a moment of, um, I never thought it would happen. And then it started to happen. And then you went through a, a sense where it was surreal. You had to pinch yourself. Has he really gone? Now he's gone, We all ce people celebrated. And then now that the celebrations died down, it's like, what's next? So it's mm. a case of a lot of people are hoping things will be better for Zimbabweans, especially the poor and struggling. But we're also realistic. We're not stupid. Zimbabweans, we're not stupid. We know that maybe the person who's taken over may not be the best thing for the country, but he is all we have. And I think those who want the country to move forward are hoping that he really is the, the right man for the job. Pasta and Haru, it's been a pleasure having you on the stream. You are welcome back any time. We will be watching Zimbabwe very closely here on Al Jazeera. And now we want to move back to the United States, to South Dakota. Activist Sarah Menning sent us this. Have a look. For the Native American communities that flank oil development and infrastructure, their populations are already strained with harsh living conditions. Oil development exposes these vulnerable communities to even more risk. And as we have learned, pipelines do break, leaking hundreds of thousands of gallons, leading to months, if not years, of cleanup. So from the Dakota Access Pipeline to Keystone to Enbridge or Kinder Morgan, many tribes are still saying no more. 
The Keystone Pipeline leak earlier this month spilled more than 200,000 gallons of oil into fields near Amherst, South Dakota, the third leak since construction began more than seven years ago. While cleanup continues, the pipeline has resumed operations. Activists have been keeping a close eye on the impact to the environment and to Native Americans. In the U.S. state of Minnesota, another pipeline, Enridge Energy's Line 3, is under consideration. Tara Hauska is with us. She is the National Campaign's Director of Honor the Earth. Tara, it's great to have you here. This story was a huge story last year. Then it went very quiet, and it just keeps bubbling along here. One of the biggest concerns that uh, Native Americans were thinking about with these pipelines was environment. Not only is it on your land, but also the damage to the environment. And now we're seeing leaks. What's the latest you can tell us about the leaks? How much damage is there? Um, you know, as you saw that that the video clip, there's 200,000 gallons of tar sands that has just spilled um, from the Keystone pipeline. And then the following day, you know, we saw the approval of Keystone XL um, in, in Nebraska. They approved a secondary route. Um, so, you know, these damaging, the damage that comes from a pipeline spill is significant. Um, there was a major Enbridge spill over in the Kalamazoo River in 2010 they are still cleaning that up. That was over a million gallons of tar sands into the Kalamazoo River. I mean, it essentially killed the river. So these pipelines are incredibly destructive because it's not just a small amount that leaks. It's a, it's a massive, massive uh, destructive force. So I want to share this from the Sierra Club. Uh, they write, the extent of the damage caused by this most recent spill remains to be seen, but it's yet another reminder that there's no such thing as a safe oil pipeline. They leak and spill, which threatens land, water, and communities. They go on to say, and pipelines spill. It's not a matter of if, but when. Keystone has already spilled many more times than TransCanada predicted. Of course, as we mentioned in the intro to this, there is another pipeline that's under consideration right now. What are activists doing? Uh, to address that. That, of course, is energy, uh, Enbridge Energy's Line 3. What are you doing? Yeah, you know, there are, uh, we have been engaged in a years-long effort to first force Enbridge to do an environmental impact statement, which, which they're in the process of, of completing right now. Um, you know, the environmental impact statement is ass being assessed for adequacy. Um, it's been written. They're, they're issuing their final uh, decision on that in April um, so the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission is deciding whether to approve or deny this Canadian tar sands line that would go through um, the headwaters of the Mississippi River and uh, to the shore of Lake Superior. That's a fifth of the world's freshwater. So we are engaged heavily in focusing on banks, doing divestment, but the people that are funding these projects, um, doing front lines resistance. There is an active camp that I'm part of called Camp Mukwa in northern Minnesota. We've been shutting down construction over in Wisconsin since they've actually started construction on either side of Minnesota. Um, and, you know, there's uh, several different efforts to raise public, public awareness, be engaged in the process, the Public Utilities Commission process, and I can guarantee there will be many, many lawsuits if this um, is indeed approved. Tara, what happened and what is happening to the people who've been out protesting on native land and now they're facing court cases? There are so many of them. What's the latest you can tell us about that? Yeah, the resistance to Dakota Access was serious. I myself was arrested along with many, many other people, hundreds of people who came out um, alongside thousands to give their potentially their freedom up to protect the water and protect the Missouri River. Um, there were over 830 cases that were brought by the state of North Dakota against uh, peaceful unarmed protesters. And, you know, we've seen hundreds of dismissals because they can't prove these charges against us. Um, that said, there are there are a couple cases that are very high profile. One is uh, Red Fawn. Um, she was charged with, you know, a felony that could be potentially very, very serious. Mm. Um, you know, her, her freedom is at risk. And there are several others, Chase Iron Eyes. Um, you know, Holyoke Lafferty, they've, they've got cases that we need to stand with them and make sure that the federal government and these corporations can't oppress the people. This is a battle terror in the final moments of our show. Uh, are Native communities, are they winning this battle against pipelines going across their land? I would say so. You know, I think that we've been able to successfully pull literally billions of dollars out of these banks that fund these projects. Um, it is a successful movement that is gaining support around the world and indigenous people have been here for a long time and will continue to be here um you know we are resilient we resist and we are strong people and we have many many allies who are joining us in this fight for mother earth which is the most important fight climate change is happening climate change is real mm -hmm. and we all need to stand together
People fighting with you, Sess says the past is still present. We're still destroying sacred lands and attacking peoples for trying to protect that land. Tara, thank you so much. We're going to leave it there. Thank you to all of our guests, guests for joining us today. If you have a story that you would like to see us update or even do right here on the stream, tweet us at hashtag AJTree. We'll see you online.